Asia Tech Podcast with Graham Brown and Michael Waits. Michael Waits. Michael Waits. Michael Waits. Hello, welcome to ATB 15. This week we are talking about fintech in Asia. It's a $10.5 billion investment market for startups, up from a billion in 2014. What are the market opportunities? But first, let's start with a follow up from recent episodes on the food delivery market in Southeast Asia. This is Asia Tech Podcast. Asia Tech Podcast. Voice of the Asian tech ecosystem. ecosystem. I wanted to do a little follow up, and it's actually follow up from a couple of weeks ago, just because I think this is a topic that's not going to end. This gets back into the food and food delivery space, if you don't mind. And yeah, let's do it. You know, I just hear, I, I keep reading about it. You know that I'm a voracious reader of news, right? So I just keep going in, I keep reading the news. And look, the fact that people keep trying in this space, I guess at some point, at some level, is a good thing. Hmm. Um, but so far, this sort of delivery of food kits or just food that some home chef is making just is not working. It just doesn't feel like it's working to me, right? right. Um, and I think that if you look at the people that are sort of quoting what's happening here, they're all using the same type of terminology. It almost reminds me of the Lozada stuff we talked about last month or the month before. I can't remember anymore. And that is, you know, they have all these really tricky words for profitability that aren't really profits, right? Hmm. So if you go down in an article that E27 wrote about this company called Tin Men, which is saying that it has raised a bunch of money. First of all, let's just talk really quickly. It says it's delivered 30,000 homemade meals per month, which I guess at some level sounds like a lot. Mm-hmm. But 30,000 a month is about one point something thousand a day. In a city of 6.7 million people, it's about two basis points. Where are these guys? Are these guys in, in India? They're in India, yeah. Right. Hyderabad. Yeah, I'm going to mispronounce that because no matter how hard I try, I just cannot get that right. But right. I should get it right. It's not that hard. It's just not that hard, right? Mm. Hy- Hyderabad or, yeah, Hyderabad, I think you pronounce it more correctly. And it's not like I'm fighting against these guys. I don't want these guys to fail. I want them to succeed. But I think this model is really challenging. And yeah. again, I just wish they'd stop using words like operationally profitable. Yeah. It really sounds to me like alternative facts is that like an alternative type of profitability of which i'm not aware yeah. so what are they suggesting that like if you exclude all the non-operational stuff they're profitable i, I, I don't know <laughs> i don't know and it also references a company we talked about last week finger licks which sounds like a strange name and ends in an x which always makes me slightly nervous <laughs> <laughs> i guess i really shouldn't say that anyway and the last thing i want to mention on this is that you know i I go to look at do and do more research on this. And if you look in the United States, there are tons of companies that do this type of thing, right? Whether it's Blue Apron that sends you a kit at home that you make yourself or some of these other companies, they just really haven't come up with a business model that's mm-hmm. worked yet. A lot of companies come in and go out. Um, and like I said, no one's really kind of nailed this model. And a lot of the supermarkets are actually starting to get in this business. They've already got the food. They've already got people working there that need things to do and they're just repacking their own kits and sending it out. So I just think we haven't heard the last of this thing yet. Right. But they're having a go. And it, of all the places to have a go, it's interesting they've, you know, India. I mean, you've got, okay, well, maybe the supermarkets aren't as established there as they are in other countries, but you've got this whole Tiffin delivery system, right? Where, I was going to say, right? right? I mean, how do you compete against that where they're charging, you know, they're charging pennies really for this stuff. And they, for some reason, somehow these guys are able to deliver hundreds of thousands of these little Tiffin lunch boxes without failure. They I was going to say, what, uh, yeah, what, what's, what's their failure rate? Like less than 1%? I know, it's crazy. I mean, it's, I, I don't know how the system works, but it works, even though it sort of all exists at the edge of chaos. But yeah, that and it's also, works, right? it's, also, it's also like a planes, trains, and automobiles thing, right? Yeah. It's not like some guy takes a meal t- next to his house. He takes it on a train, through a bus, to a guy who brings it to a girl, who then delivers it to a dog, and the dog brings it to your mom. And it's like everybody gets something in the middle, and then it gets around time every day. Right. So, I mean, that supply chain, that, that logistic system is just, well, it's fantastic. How it works, well, it's witchcraft. We don't know. We have to dig a little bit deeper. Maybe can, somebody can tell us, but... Well, there you go. I mean, for the price they pay, you know, I don't know. I mean, how do you compete against that? I, I don't know. But even so, so these guys, just the last thing I'll say is these guys said they want to have 300,000 orders a month by the end of this year. Let's just do really quickly. 300,000, hmm. you know, if you have 25 days in a month, it's 12,000 a day in a city of 6.7 million people. 
multiplied by 10,000 to get basis points, you're still talking about 18 basis points. So unless my math is wrong, hmm. um, it's just not a lot. And I understand that India is really populous, and that's great, right? And I love the startup ecosystem in India. I think they're doing a lot of really amazing things. But in this in particular, in any country, we've talked about this, I just don't think it's a model that's going to work. Anyway, that's just some follow-up from um, from last week. Yeah. Well, now, it, it would be good to find some startups who are really cracking this market and doing it well, right? That's what we've got to keep an eye out for. So that food delivery market, you know, we're keen to find out who's making that work. Yeah, I want to see a full-stack business model. And so far, we talked about it a little bit. I've only seen one company out there that really does the full-stack and they're making great business progress, but they would not be out there bragging about being operationally profitable. So no. let's just leave it at that. Anyway, fintech. Fintech is gigantic. Yeah, let's do it. Um, it's really what I want to focus on this week. And there are so many different categories of fintech, whether it's you know just B2C payments or B2B payments or the unbanked or what we're, we can call migrant workers or people that don't have their own credit history and all the way to sort of alternative currencies, microfinance, and even existing financial products that are getting disintermediated like wealth management for super high net worth individuals. I mean, it runs the gamut. And I really get the feeling that, let's see how long this conversation lasts today, but I feel like there's another episode. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, if we can talk about food tech two or three times, I have a feeling we'll be talking about... Um, fintech along the way where, where do you want to start well let's get a thirty thousand foot view of fintech let's draw it out what is the lay of the landscape what exactly is it i mean you mentioned those categories you mentioned the different types of markets currencies applications like microfinance and you know existing models like in financial products and so on what why is there a need for fintech i know it sounds obvious that there's always need for innovation but what's sort of broken in the market right now let's start maybe there and then sort of work backwards and see what kind of solutions there are out there so what's broken let's really talk about unbanked i think that's really where the whole thing starts because if you don't have a place to store the money that you're earning then it's in a proverbial mattress somewhere and if it's in the proverbial mattress then you're left out of Anything that's sort of e-commerceified, any type of electronic commerce that's taking place, it means you've then got to find a way to pay for things. Mm -hmm. And I think that runs the whole gamut, right? So if you go to an e-commerce company and you're unbanked, so you have money but you don't have enough money, let's say, for a bank account, or there's just no bank near where you live and all you really have is a, a mobile phone and a smartphone – Maybe the only way you can pay for that is using some alternative method of payment where you store money, let's say, on your phone. Or let's say you store money nowhere, but you use your phone bill. And they used to do this years ago in Japan, right? Docomo used to do this. You could have a game or some type of activity that you needed to pay for, and you just got included in your phone bill. Yeah. And I think that's really where this whole thing starts. Now, remember as well... If you don't have a bank account, it probably means you don't have a credit history, hmm. right? And if you don't have a credit history, then how do you borrow the money, even if it's a small amount of money, to sort of make your day-to-day -day payments? That's whether you're running a home business that makes, you know, hats or food or anything that you're selling. How do you get paid? How do you make payments to buy your ingredients or buy the equipment that you're using. It's a real big problem. It's a very big chicken and egg problem, right? You have no credit, so how can you prove to people that you're worthy? How do they even know how big your business is because they don't have an electronic record that they can see every month or every week mm. to sort of check and confirm that your business is at a certain level? And what if you're not working in your home country? Right, and this is a big problem, right, that we've seen in Asia particularly. A lot of people, this, especially the Filipinos, right? I mean, they're a very mobile population moving out of Asia to Singapore, Hong Kong, or the Middle East as well. Right. So I remember the first time I went to the Philippines. It must be 10 or, 10 or more years ago. And on my way home back to – I was living in Tokyo at the time. I noticed that there was a line, a specific immigration line for what they were calling overseas Filipino workers. And I think they actually call it OFW. Now – Back then, they were probably sending something like 10 to $12 billion a year mm. from overseas 
and remitting it back into the Philippines. And again, it was really hard to do at the time. And I think it's just as hard now, although there are some new applications out there and some new services out there that are allowing them to do this. But based on statistics from the end of 2015 into 2016, I believe this is almost $30 billion a year now of remittance that goes from overseas Filipino workers into the Philippines. So there's a massive market. Just think about what $30 billion is. So that's just for the Philippines? That's just for the Philippines. Wow. Right. And there's and no, there's notice, no options, is there? There really isn't a lot of good options. I mean, you've got Western Union and all that, but that's really, you know, that's fraught with a whole bunch of problems. If you just try to use that normally between America and UK, for example, it's a pain in the ass. Excuse my French, but... No, it is. And, and just, think, just think about the concept of Western Union. I mean, Western Union, isn't that a business that was developed during like the Pony Express? <laughs> right. <laughs> just exactly. my idea. Yeah. But, but, but now there are things like Ayana, okay? And Ayana is a service basically developed in the Philippines that gives alternative payment systems to people in the Philippines to return their money home. And it's not the only one, right? You've got plenty of other services out there, like Fasta Cash as well. It's a really interesting new business that has been funded as well. And what these businesses do is they use the concept of mobile social networks to allow people, even locally, but really anywhere in the world, to move money from one person to another person or to another institution that's actually on the same platform. Mm -hmm. And to me, that's sort of an epiphany of how you can change the way payments are done using existing platforms where you know everybody is. Facebook is one of them, but it's WhatsApp, I believe Line as well, that any of these mobile so social chat applications, they're already connected, a lot of them are already encrypted or becoming fully encrypted, and it allows you to move cash over them. This, I think, is really, really important. So I guess the challenge for these fintech companies is to spend as little time as possible in the traditional, if I can use that word, financial system, right? In that They only touch it at the beginning and the end when they extract the cash and put it back in, and they right. want to use their own sort of infrastructure to transport it between those two nodes. Absolutely. Right? That's the challenge, isn't it? Because anything else all the other systems trying to use the existing financial institutions you try and wire money between countries wow good luck if you get it across to the next border right but if they can just take it out of, use these existing social networks as that infrastructure you know that will solve a big chunk of the problem that fintech companies are facing it is and again it allows for a whole bunch of other um impetuses as well right so you have Worker mobility, now it's not so difficult to send money home. And if you look at sort of wage differentiation between countries where some of these overseas workers are living and working, you know, I spent some time in the Middle East, in Dubai, in Abu Dhabi, and there are plenty of overseas workers there who are happily employed, living a very good life and sending money back to their families, whether it's their children, their husbands, their wives or whatever. And the ability to be able to do this easily is actually really, really powerful, right? I mean, in the old days, when they were living closer to the region or even living further away, they literally had to bring cash home every year. Mm. Right. And there's so, limits on that, right? You can't get cash through the customs. Sure. Sure. I mean, even in your even in your country and in my country, coming over a border with money that you saved up all year, and that number, if it's thirty billion dollars a year, yeah. I'm not saying people are carrying a million dollars of cash with them, but they could be carrying ten thousand, twelve thousand, fifteen thousand dollars of cash. Right. And in most countries, it's hard to get that amount of cash in and probably much harder now with the type of airport security and all the other sort of security issues that we're up against um, when, once you get on an airplane and get off an airplane. Exactly. Right? And it's only going to get harder, isn't it? I mean, there's, I mean, people talk about war on cash. I know some people have gone to the extreme to say that governments want to confiscate this dirty paper thing. Sure. And I can see that sort of becoming more of a, an issue, trying to get money between countries you know walking i mean if, you know you go into india now i don't know how much money you can take into the country no but, idea you know it's not good the way you know, the, the legislation they brought in to get rid of traditional payment i suppose you know they want to elect want to put everything online because you know they want to drive out corruption and all that so that's going in one way but i mean fintech is it really is it all about the unbanked and migrant workers is that really where it's going to start is that what excites you about it at the moment michael 
Well, there are a few things that excite me, but I want to touch on I want to touch on a couple of more things, right? One of them we talked a little bit about. If you don't have your own bank account, if you're unbanked, then it's hard to do a credit score for you. So it's hard to determine whether you're actually um, an appropriate customer for a loan or for any type of lending. And there are a bunch of companies out there, you know, globally, but particularly that focus on unbanked markets. One of them is Tala Mobile. And one of them is on Lendo, right? So Lendo is a really interesting business that's doing a new credit scoring and credit verification that's taking hundreds of um, data points for each particular client, whether it's a per- an individual or a small and medium-sized business, right? So SMBs or SMEs, and trying to determine whether they are um, okay for credit. And they're also doing two things in relation to some other of these online lending businesses, right? Like Crowdo, who's also trying to crowdfund um, mm-hmm. peer-to-peer lending. So these companies actually, not in conjunction necessarily, but they take a different tact on this. And the ability to credit score someone who has no credit history is actually really powerful because then you can actually put them out on a peer-to-peer platform where the regulations permit. And that's another big issue, right, is – are the regulators able to catch up with the speed with which technology is being developed? And we can talk about that um, as well. But in this case, you can then, because in the old days, right, you had to walk into a bank with filled out some paperwork, and maybe those those parameters weren't necessarily relevant to the type of loan you were trying to get or the type of borrowing you were trying to do. But now the statistics and the sort of parameters that companies like Lendo and even more edgy, I think, what Tala Mobile is trying to do are just completely different. So Tala, this is a this is a, a great company. And I first heard about this company in the middle to the sort of the end of last year. The idea here is that you give that, that the things you do on your mobile phone, <laughs> that everything that you do there defines who you are. Right. And I think it'd be pretty hard to find somebody who would argue with it that that's actually the case. And while it's possible to create a sort of fake online presence, whether it's on Twitter or on Facebook or even in Gmail where you can create multiple, multiple accounts, right? Big problems on Twitter result from this. But the phone you carry and the phone from which you make most of your phone calls, from which you do most of your emailing and from which you do most of your texting really does define you. And if I said to you, you can get credit if you're sort of a good person or credit worthy, if you give me access to a bunch of data on your cell phone, you would potentially do that. And that's really what Tala Mobile is doing. So for unbanked countries, right, mostly in in Africa, but also in the Philippines, and that's why I want to talk about this, basically what they say is your personality is evoked through what you do on your cell phone, and they can tell with a very high degree of, um, of certainty They say they have a a repayment rate of almost 90%, okay, based on all the data that they take off your cell phone. How often do you call your mother? How often do you make a phone call? Are you texting from multiple accounts or only one account? Interestingly enough, when I listened to the the, the founder of this company talk, you would think, right, that – if you spoke multiple languages or if you're communicating in multiple languages, it would make you look smarter and hence it would make you look like a better credit risk. Mm Mm-hmm. But actually, if I remember correctly, what she said was, and this is a woman named what, Shivani Shiroya, and what she said was, what they found is that actually, if you speak multiple languages, you're actually much more likely to be less credit worthy if you're an unbanked person. And I forget the reasons why, but we can mm-hmm. go back and find that out. But it was just interesting. The point is that if they watch your behavior, which is kind of unfiltered on your mobile phone and on your smartphone, they can determine with about 90% accuracy whether or not you'll be a good credit risk. Wow. So they are using a fundamentally different criteria to a traditional credit agency like a Geico or like in Europe, you've got like Experian and so on. They, yeah, I mean, who, who would do it based on, you know, your ability to repay bills, right? Or how long exactly. you've lived on the electoral roll. And these guys are looking at your phone behavioral data and crunching that yeah. and saying, is yeah, that I mean, right? Really- yeah, they're just trying to say, like, do you normally pay the bills that we do know about on time? And, like, how often do you call your mother and your father or your, or your brother and sister? Or, you know, how often do you call your friends? They're just trying to build consistent behavior because their belief is that people with consistent behavior will consistently pay their bills as well. Right. And, you know, again, they're happy if you give them data that says that you pay your bills. But even without 
sort of a complete monetary um, like CV on you, they can still figure out, again, with 90% certainty, according to them, that you can be credit worthy or whether you can or cannot be credit worthy. And to me, that's fascinating because that it's fascinating. a completely different take, yeah. right? Like, like you said earlier, normally you'd walk into a bank or other credit unions and they'd say, okay, what's your job? How much money do you make? What are your yeah. assets? But it doesn't mean you could be really, really wealthy and still not pay your bills. Exactly. Or you, right? yeah, or you could have just you know, turned up in the neighborhood and come from abroad, right? And you have no history. So, Sure. So no one understands your level of consistency, right? Exactly. So, I mean, I don't know the data for Asia, but I was just having a quick scan that the data for the U.S. is 56% of U.S. consumers have subprime credit scores which would make them a, a risk. That's according to uh, CFD, CFED. So basically, they are people who are going to be penalized by the system, right? So would you say that with a different criteria that some of those 56% would come out better? Would, would say, you know, okay, under this old credit scoring system, you're subprime, but under this, you know, we realize you're a lot more consistent. Maybe you are low income, but consistent in paying bills. Is it those people that are going to benefit? I would venture a guess that that data you said comes from the United States. Yeah. Yeah. So my guess on this or my feeling on this would be that because of the history of U.S. families and U.S. individuals over leveraging, that those people that are that are not a valid for, that are not credit worthy, would remain credit worthy because their behavior is probably inconsistent as well. So no, I don't think that they would fall into a new category. I think they'd still remain subprime. And the reason why is because if you look at their data alone, it has n nothing to do with how much money you make, but how much money you've spent. Mm -hmm. And the inconsistency with which you've behaved in relation to how much money you have and how much money you've spent. I think that data, is, that data would fall out. So 56% of people in the U.S. are considered to be subprime. I don't think that would surprise anybody, actually, right, yeah. to be fair. And I, I think in this region, there's, again, because of the stage of development of the economy and the level of net worth, right, of GDP per capita, excuse me, is that people have to be more sort of frugal and consistent with the way they use the money that they do have. So part of the problem in the U.S. is that people live above their means. It's a very common phrase, right? You make $60,000 a year, you live like you make one hundred and twenty dollars because you're aspirationally living like your next job. Mm -hmm. The biggest problem is that you never get to your next job. Exactly. Yeah. And you're encouraged to borrow a lot more than you can afford to borrow, right? I mean, that's the whole, that's the problem that we've had. But in, in these Asian markets, one of the big problems is a lot of people don't have the history because they haven't been living in that place long enough or they don't have that kind of generational history that you may have in the US. A lot of people have come from migrant workers. A lot of people moved in from, you know, the, the rural areas to cities, right? I mean, that's a phenomenon all over Asia, right? It is. So the people don't have a history. So those traditional credit scores won't work so well in that kind of environment. Is that what we're saying? Uh, it is. And the other thing is that there's also a very different perception of debt in, in the region. And, and that perception is you're not the only person who's taking yeah. debt, right? In other words, yeah. it's, it's you and your entire family, which means if you don't pay it back, your family not just loses face, but they also lose their own sort of ability to raise credit. Right? There, was a, there was an innovative company out here that was hiring motorcycle drivers, right? And they were all, you know, using those motorcycle drivers to deliver products, and some of those products were quite expensive. So how did you prevent the driver who was making, let's say, 15000 baht a month from stealing a device that was 29000 baht a month, and they were delivering seven of them or 20 of them a month? Mm -hmm. How do you prevent that? Well, what you do is you make him put down a deposit of 30,000 or 40,000 baht that he's accumulated from asking his family. Right, there you go. His other, his cousin, his brother, whomever. And if he loses that deposit, he's not just answering to the company for stolen goods, which are probably insured at some level. He now has to go back to his family and answer to them. Yeah, right. This is a big problem. Yeah, but that's how you build accountability. That's how you build repayments right that's how you get people to repay 90 percent of the time you connect yeah, to that social network right 
Correct. You just use different rules and you use different social norms to convince people as opposed to having a collection agency come. You just involve somebody's, yeah. as you said, social network, including their family, and they're much more likely and they have a much larger incentive to pay things back. Yeah. Well, that's how they do things in Japan. Very much so collecting debt. I believe that they will turn up at your office right. and speak to your boss. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> Serious. I mean, I was surprised when I heard about these instances happening. But you would never, you could never perceive that in, a, in another country, in Europe or America, that that's, that would be the common practice. But that's the whole Asian attitude, isn't it, towards debt, that it's not just you, but it's the honor of everybody that's connected to you around you that's also being impacted by your inability to pay. Yeah, I don't think this is a big surprise at all, right? So that's Telemobile. What else excites you at the moment in the fintech market in Asia? Well, I think so. Crowdfunding, right, is something I think that's going to be really important as well. Yeah. Um, we haven't spent really any time talking about this, but I think we need to back up a little bit and talk about where, like, the development of crowdfunding in other markets. We talk a lot here about, and you and I talk a lot about this, how we can kind of see the future mm -hmm. because we watch what happens in developing markets and we can presume with a little bit of tweaking what's going to happen in a developed market, right? So... In 2012, there was a big push in the United States because of the onset of things like Kickstarter and Indiegogo. There was a big push in the United States to make crowdfunding and equity crowdfunding available for the masses, right? Because at, the, at that point in time, it was really just for qualified investors. You had to have a threshold of a certain level of net worth and a certain level of money in the bank, and you could only invest a certain amount of money in the startup community. And it almost kind of felt like it was rigged against smaller investors. In other words, if anybody can get on a plane and go to Vegas and risk their entire net worth, regardless of how much money they have, on red number 17, the idea was why shouldn't everybody be able to do crowdfunding as long as there are rules and parameters put around, right? So as part of the 2012 Jobs Act, you had guys like Jason Best and his team. These are people that really went out and stumped for crowdfunding and equity crowdfunding in particular – and said, look, let's change the laws around this and give people the right to invest a certain percentage of their income. So, and I don't remember exactly what the percentage is, right? But if you have $5 million, you can invest, you know, $250,000 or, or $500,000. And if you have $50,000, you can invest 500 bucks, but you're not completely shut out, mm -hmm. right? So this was sort of implemented over time. And I believe the last piece of this legislation was signed or implemented in 2015 or maybe even the beginning of 2016 but you saw it took time okay and i think what happened was that those people that did that in the united states that wrote the legislation that sat in front of congress and convinced the senate and the house of representatives and the president to pass the the bills into law are now starting to become prominent globally flying to malaysia flying to singapore talking to the monetary authority of singapore and talking to the other regulatory agencies in all the countries in, in, in Southeast Asia. And remember, they all have slightly different regulatory regimes, right? So the Bank of Thailand and the SEC here have different rules and sort of different concerns than the Bank Negara Malaysia. which And there are a couple of regulatory agencies in Malaysia. Indonesia has its own view on this with Vietnam having the State Securities Commission. There are a lot of ways to look at this. And in one sense sort of Singapore is going to lead, I believe, in this in this way. And you're already starting to see a little bit of equity crowdfunding coming in there and a little bit in Indonesia. And I believe you're going to see some of it start to come here. But before that happened, you have companies like Aziola and also DreamMaker in Thailand in particular starting this sort of rewards-based crowdfunding. So they're testing in the same way that Kickstarter did back when they started and also Indiegogo. They're working on sort of physical and kind of artistic projects to get the market used to this whole concept right. of small people can fund big things, mm -hmm. right? But they're, on, they're only getting rewards in return for now. Right. So that's the traditional Kickstarter type crowdfunding, isn't it? Where you are one of the early backers of this project. It could be a movie. It could be somebody making wooden watches. Yes. But you'll get a, some kind of, you might get the product or you might get some kind of mention that's the kind of early stage crowdfunding. And you've also mentioned equity crowdfunding, which is, I guess, a more advanced stage, isn't it? It's more in line with the kind of things we talk about here. Is, which of these do you see 
you know, the market really heading in a direction of? Is it the equity crowdfunding that you're really sort of keen to see grow? You think that's going to grow or is it still has, stuck has in that reward stage? Be, right? No, it has to be, right? So imagine if you invested, not invested, but if you paid money for the guys who started Oculus in the United States right. and you paid your $25 or $1,000 or whatever it was back in the day and all you got was a t-shirt or a cap that said Oculus on it. That's what they were giving you. Yeah. But in return or in, in reverse, let's just say you got a 1% or a 0.5% equity stake in Oculus and you're willing to take that risk to help them fund their prototyping, right? Mm -hmm. Well, when Facebook bought Oculus for, what was it, a billion dollars or $900 million? I can't remember the exact number. The people who funded it via crowdfunding actually got nothing. Mm -hmm. Okay, but the founders and whoever the um, VCs were obviously had a big windfall. So the idea is to be able to give those people that took the risk, the early adopters, and say, you should actually have some a financial incentive as well as sort of a bragging incentive to be able to do this. And I think what's going to happen here is you're going to start to see the same thing here. So the regulators have actually started to come around to this, right? And I believe very um, strongly that you're going to see it. It's already happened in Singapore a little bit. I know some of the people that run the companies that do equity crowdfunding. And, and it's important, right? Because what does equity crowdfunding really mean? It's the... For lack of a better term, it's sort of the democratization yeah. of investments in startup companies. Right. Low barriers to entry, right? Yeah, I mean, lower than, lower than not being able to be involved, right? I mean, in a way, it's kind of not fair. I hate to talk about fairness and the concept of investing, but why shouldn't you be able to put your $5,000 into pick your startup? It doesn't matter to me, mm -hmm. right? In other words... If you can get – because the way the way that works, right, from a crowdfunding perspective – and this is where it gets really interesting, right? Because they don't take the $5,000 and then give it directly to the company into which you're investing. What do they do? They create a limited liability company, a special purpose vehicle or a special purpose company, and they consolidate that money into one entity that then that entity invests in the company, why does that matter and why is that exciting? Well, as a startup founder, you don't want to manage 40 or 50 people on your cap table. Right. Got it. You, you just don't, right? Because it just gets logistically too hard to deal with. But if you have one block that's made up of 40 people, you don't care because what that SPV does, right, or the LLC is it votes as a block. Mm -hmm. So if that total is 100000 or $200,000 or if you've done all of your seed funding through that entity or even part of it, they vote along with everybody else. But only one entity votes, not the 40 people that have put in their 2500 or $5,000. And that's where the real power of this comes in because the cap table remains clean. When you grow fast enough or far enough that a real VC can come in or even later stage high net worth individuals who can on their own put in $250,000 mm – -hmm then your cap table is still clean because if you have to clean that up later, if you really take that money from your friends and family in really small pieces, let's say your company does grow really quickly and you want to fund more, funding with like 25 people on your cap table is almost impossible. And it's almost like everything else, right? If you solve that problem before you get to it, so you consolidate all those investors into one entity, which is what equity crowdfunding really allows you to do, you're keeping your cap table clean and you're making your next round of investment actually much easier. So that to me, along with the fact that you're democratizing it, because remember, every one of your investors is also an advertiser for your company. For sure. Right? You see, And you, you see the way that works? Is that clear? Mm -hmm. In the sense that if I have one lady who's a high net worth individual invest $250,000 in, in my company – I'm relying on her and then her ability to tell her whole network that I'm a great company and to use my service or to just, you know, market for me. But if I had 50 individuals who've put in $5,000, they are completely, and for lack of a better term, invested emotionally as well mm -hmm. in wanting that company to succeed. And that's the real power of the crowd, right? And that's why equity crowdfunding is something that really excites me. And I also think that whereas it took four or five years to happen in the United States, it's really just going to take two or three years out here because once they see, once the regulators here see that it's happening without sort of regular incident in the United States, and there will always be fraud, right? 
but the fraud I think is going to be kept to a minimum because of the platform. Right. If that makes any sense, right? Because because the regulators are involved, which is good actually, right? And because the amount of money that you're going to be able to invest is tied to what your net worth is, or what your GDP per capita is, and because you know the whole thing is being watched over, it means that there should be less fraud involved in doing this. And because there's already been years of experience in other markets, they're able to take that experience and put that to work here. I think this is a really big deal. And because I think in some cases, your super high net worth individuals, and we've talked about this before, are way more risk averse in this region, right? Because they're second and third generation family businesses, no matter how wealthy they are. Then people that have earned a little bit of money on their own that look around that pay real close attention to what's happening on their cell phone and on their tablet and say, if I could invest in this, I would. But for now, all I can get is a T-shirt. Gotcha. So obviously, this is going to depend a lot on country by country basis, depending on which regulatory authorities are going to give it the green light. Where do you see it happening first in Asia? Singapore. I think it's already happening there. And then, then I think the market leader is really going to be Thailand because you – for for lack of a better reason, it's just much less complicated, right? In other words, in a country like Malaysia, it's not just the financial system, but it's also sort of the social and cultural system there mm. that governs the way money can be used, for lack of a better term. And I think Indonesia has very similar issues. But I do believe Indonesia is probably more, in this case, you're seeing a sort of role reversal where Malaysia had been the market leader when it came to finance I think yeah. Indonesia is starting to understand that if they can do that well, that they can be the market leaders there, right? And uh, like, I, like I've said the entire time we've been doing this, the more Japanese money that gets invested in Indonesia, and there's a lot of aspirational money going into there simply because of the size of the market, the more likely it is for that market to sort of change and adapt faster, particularly um, – associated with finance. So again, really big Japanese companies like SoftBank have invested in really big Indonesian companies like Tokopedia. Tokopedia is a marketplace to pay for things on that marketplace. You need to have a payment system. And to be able to do that and do crowdfunding and sort of organize all these things, I believe they're going to have to move much faster um, than a market like Malaysia, which only has 20 something million people in it. So they, they can take a little bit more time, I believe. And Vietnam, I don't think is ready yet for it, but we'll get there. And, you know, you have countries like um, Myanmar, which I think is going to lag behind, but it's going to catch up really quickly. And I think sort of in three to four years from now, you'll see all the countries out there doing some semblance of equity crowdfunding. I don't think we're that far away, to be fair. But, but you bring up a really good point, actually, or, or maybe I brought it up, and that is you kind of have to have the establishment of the to sort of spin all the way back around to the beginning. You kind of have to have the establishment of some of these big marketplaces locally to make the necessity for payments, right? This is just either person to person payments, person to business payments, or business to business payments frictionless. Yeah. Right. And that gets back to something I think that you wanted to talk about a little bit, and that is if you go all the way back to the beginning of online payments, you go back to PayPal, right? Yeah. Well, I mean, PayPal really is an interesting case study, isn't it, of how to do it. I mean, they've built a parallel payment system as much as they could have done outside of the, the traditional payment system. But at the end of the day, it still exists. You've got to take the money out and put it back in. But, you know, what they've achieved I suppose is pretty phenomenal and they've done that. They couldn't have done it without the support of being embedded with eBay early on. I mean, that really was the key to their success. And I know you've mentioned about the Pez sellers in the last episode, right? But those sort of hardcore fans, those people who had a real need. And I think that maybe points back to those migrant workers, the people that we talk about who absolutely have to have this solution because something's broken. Mm -hmm. And in eBay, it was the power sellers. You know, these people who couldn't rely on a check, who couldn't rely on a wire transfer, and their payment or choice of payment system would have made or broken a deal. So it was absolutely essential to have something which kind of operated outside of the existing framework or you know, provided a better way of doing things. So I look at these fintech companies, Michael, and I think, you know, which of these companies in Asia is really built on a market where that market absolutely needs it because there's no alternative for them to do this or what's out there is broken? Because I think the problem with a lot of, 
uh, ideas in this space is sometimes they're a bit kind of, if I can use the word Star Trek, you know, they're sort of technology for technology's sake rather than something that's actually solving a problem. Right. So I look at eBay and say, right, okay, PayPal works, you know, PayPal outgrew eBay in terms of valuation far, you know, far along the line as a result of being embedded with those power sellers early on. So where are we seeing that in the fintech space in Asia? That's what I'm really curious. From a marketer's perspective, you know, I want to know where's that beachhead of fans that are out there. We talked about the unbanked, low credit, migrant workers and so on. I think there's more to it there. There's a few markets that we haven't tapped where these fintech solutions could really solve an everyday problem that people are facing. There are. So, you know, a lot of these businesses are based on um, statistics, right? Right. Meaning, meaning if I have a million people, how many of them are going to default on whatever payment they're making, whether it's a loan payment, right, or even a credit card payment? So if you go back to this concept of why did PayPal succeed, I won't even ask the rhetorical question. Right. But if you think about something you've referenced as well, the existing that this system was necessary because the existing systems that handled payments were not reliable. What does reliable mean? People didn't trust them. Mm -hmm. And trust is the key to the entire online system in the same way, I would add, not to get too philosophical, that an IOU. Which right. sort of was the beginning of money, right? In other it ain't words, worth any gold. You can't change it for gold anymore, can you? It's so. not worth anything. Like in the old days, right? So I had a cow, you had a sheep. I wanted part of your sheep. You wanted part of my cow. I'd give you a piece of it. But maybe I didn't have a cow at the time, but I had a baby cow. Like there's a way to do this. And you said, <laughs> okay, I'll take some of your sheep. And in two months, I'll give you the cow. That two months is an IOU, right? And that just developed into money. That IOU turns into cash and that cash turns into backed by gold or whatever. And that means now you can now trust me because that IOU was then governed by some law. And, and that's how money developed in a really basic and sort of very sort of glossed over sense, right? So how do you do that online? Hmm. Well, you have eBay as the beginning of this and, and you, know, you can fast forward all the way to, to Amazon, Lazada, pick any kind of online commerce. And you say, well, how can I trust that this is going to work? Where's the trust? But bigger than that, and you mentioned this, and I think this is actually a really interesting concept that I haven't seen done yet, but I think would be really great. And that is this. You have something in the United States called affinity cards, right? So mm -hmm. everybody who belongs to an Elks club or everybody who's an, a fan of the Seattle Seahawks can get a credit card, a Visa card or, or something that – or a MasterCard that is branded by the Seahawks or some such group, Right. But imagine all and – it, and it's all based on um, actuarial math, right? How many of those people will default and how many won't? You know, that's why the credit cards have these sort of payment schemes where you have to pay 3% or 5% whatever for transaction costs. A lot of that goes to insurance. So what do you do, right, to prevent, it, to prevent people from defaulting actuarially? So think about this. Let's say you took every Filipino overseas worker who has no credit card, no credit history – Right. And Ayana or a company like that that provides payment services for them to send money back to the Philippines, which on a yearly basis, as we already said, is somewhere between 26 and 30 billion dollars a year, says, OK, guess what? From now on, because I know how much money you're sending back and forth every year, I can guess statistically how much money you are making and I can look at your history now. And maybe partner with Tala and say, I can see your behavior on a mobile phone. I'm going to issue everybody who I think is a super duper easy credit risk an Ayana branded credit card. Mm -hmm. And we're going to put credit terms on those credit cards that are very similar to credit terms you have in the United States, but, but easier. In other words, none of this sort of 13% until you don't pay, then it's 18% or then it's 25%. And then I'm going to sort of come after your small children if you don't pay any back. Mm -hmm. But actuarially and statistically, it's very likely that as a group, those people that are sending $30 billion back will probably make most of their payments. And Tala has already proven to us that they can guess or they can estimate based on your cell phone behavior to an, with a 90% degree of, um, of, of correctness that, they, that they'll know whether you will pay or not pay that back. And I wonder why no one's done this because that actually closes the gap, right? Now you have a credit card and now you can 
apply to other systems, electronic systems, to make payments. I'm just waiting for this to happen. Mm. What do you think? I mean, am I missing something there? Yeah, no, you're on the ball. I think it's all going to come down to belief in the system, right? Trust. And so it's going to come down to somebody who can build a system of analyzing and de-risking these payments for everybody and be able to export that data. And we live in a time where, you know, people talk about big data and be able to crunch the numbers. They can produce, they can understand patterns. They can match patterns of behavior with certain outcomes, with certain, you know, payment response rates and so on. So I think we live at a time where this is all possible. It's going to, you know, if, even if you think like the whole credit system, the word credit, you know, it comes from the Latin credo, which means to believe, right? So that is the fundamental baseline here for all this fintech stuff to work is you've got to have trust in the system. Because, you know, at the extreme end, you've got things like Bitcoin, which we haven't mentioned yet. But that's a good example where trust is a major issue. People won't accept that as a currency or a very small group of people will accept that as a currency. And on the nearer end, we've got, you know, dealing with trust with day-to-day payments, like, for example, these migrant workers. So I believe whoever's going to solve that problem, and they're not going to use traditional credit scoring methodologies to do that, is really sitting on top of a gold mine, you know, of information, which you could sell to anybody, right? You could convince yeah. people, anybody that we run these algorithms and we know from this kind of behavior, you're going to get this kind of outcome. Well, wow. you know, if you can do that, I think that's the kind of company that I would be interested in investing in. Yeah, because, but that's the whole basis for it, right? Is the whole, that whole concept of, of trust and the companies that can do that are the companies that are going to be worth a fortune, right? Yeah. And the companies that use a new way to use, use data. So there are two things that are going to, two other types of companies that are going to have to happen in Southeast Asia, right? One of them is Stripe, and Stripe itself is actually starting to make a move out here, okay? But the other type of, and that's just pure payments, right? It's a way to let people and let stores who sort of don't have any other way to take a payment, take a payment, okay? So it's it's peer-to-peer kind of across the board. In other words, business to business, business to consumer, and even consumer to consumer. And they've done billions of dollars of payments. But the other the other type of business, right, and this is something that Max Levchin, and he was one of the original founders of PayPal, has been working on for a while now. It's a company called Affirm. And Affirm is a company, is, again, that gives credit lines to people that don't necessarily have enough money to pay for the big things that they want to purchase. But they create a different way for them to make sort of monthly or periodic payments to buy big things. And then the more they do that, the better their credit risk becomes and the more money they can borrow. And they're very good about doing the math and sort of, as we talked about earlier, the actuarial math around this. And what they do is they partner with e-commerce sites and they say, you want to sell a mattress or you want to sell a cell phone. We know based on all the things about this client that they can afford to make a $12 a month payment. Mm -hmm. And they're never going to stop making it, right? And that that is a great business. And that business is going to have to come out to Southeast Asia as well, For sure. um, I, I think. Yeah. So are they? So let me understand. They are actually using their algorithms, their you know their formula for assessing your credit risk for their product, right? For their for their lending to you. So I'm curious to know: um, is there any company that's actually taking the role of somebody like a? like Geico in the, the States who are actually just doing purely the credit scoring, but under in this non-traditional way. Yeah. So Lendo, Lendo's trying to do that. Right. Gotcha. That's exactly. And that was the point I was trying to make earlier is that you have companies like Crowdo. Every, I guess all these companies have to end with an O for mm-hmm. some reason, but Crowdo wants to do the peer to peer lending. And what Lendo wants to do is they want to create the platform and, and you know, Crowdo has its own platform, but it looks to me that what Lendo wants to do is, is create a different sort of analytic platform that's separate from the actual lending itself, but that they sell those services to people that want to lend money to others. And they'll probably, on top of that, build a peer-to-peer lending business and a loan business, a loan portfolio on top of that, too, that takes advantage um, of, both of, of both of their sort of analytic products, right? Mm. So they do, they do verification and they do scoring as well. And both of those things, are, I think, are be going to become very, very important. Right. And where are these guys based? 
They're in Singapore. Right. And I think they're based in Singapore for a reason. You know, we can talk about this as well. But I think this actually deserves another entire episode with some other things in the in the fintech space. And that is, you know, there's been a long competition about who's going to be the financial center in, in Asia. And, you know, there's always been very big competition between Hong Kong and Singapore. Hmm. We can make a guess as to whether, you know, who, which regulator, the Monetary Authority of Singapore or the HKMA, right? The Hong Kong Monetary Authority is going to be more welcoming to this stuff. But I think they're going to battle this out in the marketplace. And I think we can spend a lot of time talking about that as well. Hmm. Um, but I'd like to pause because I think we covered a un, – unless you want to keep going on this. But I think there's been a ton of stuff covered here. And I think over time we're just going to continue to – because this is endemic to the entire process, right? Anything that happens in the e-commerce or electronic or tech ecosystem, tech startup space, it's going to have to include something that includes payments yeah. or some type of financial technology. We haven't even touched on investing or stock market analysis or even investment products to high net worth individuals. So there's a lot to talk about, but I think this is probably a good place to, to pause yeah, um, yeah. We've only scratched the surface. I mean, you've got a long list of companies we've got on our our cheat sheet here, and we've only yeah. just covered it, right? I mean, there's a lot more exciting ones. We haven't even started on those yet, so. No, and I think we could actually handle each one of these companies or a yeah. group of these companies in depth, right? We should break this down into sort of categories of lenders, mm. payments, so business to business, business consumer and payments, services, analytics, crowdfunding. We can spend literally a long time on each one of these topics and talk about them and i, I welcome the opportunity to do that That'd as we go you know what just uh i know you're big on infrastructure michael my thing is i'm big on whenever there's a gold rush on i like to do the, i like to back the uh the pan the pan what are, the jeans manufacturers and the the pan handling what do you call exactly. it the, the j who's ll bean jc penny these guys that came out of the gold rush those Leave are the us. yeah Levi's. Levi's. In those rivets, on, rivets on denim, yeah. Liver rivets on denim. But wasn't L.L. Bean the guys that made the pan handles for the, or something like that? Was it J.C. Penny? One of those guys did, right? I, I, don't, I don't know. All I know from L.L. Bean is that, um, is that preppy kids wear them to college. Right. That's really all. Well, they've come a long way. But I see, <laughs> yeah. I mean, you know, you mentioned this Lendo guys. Those are the guys I think there's going to be a lot of companies that come and go, but it's these guys that can kind of build out this, statistical infrastructure this analytical infrastructure for these you know obviously higher risk startups that are going to come into this space that i think are going to gain so yeah i think we'll let i think we'll end every conversation the same way platforms you build me a platform yeah yeah agreed like it good do we have a surprise this week michael well so there's always some big surprise in the news right right I always like to end on a slightly sarcastic tone. tone. So here's the thing. In the old days, right, meaning back in 2013 and 2014, Rocket Internet was the gorilla in the room. And every time you mention their name, people would shudder because they just seemed to be so scary, right? They were like a bully that would just walk in and kind of steal everybody's boyfriend or girlfriend, depending on which way you uh, leaned. Um, But now I think they're more of a little bit of a joke and, and kind of in the same way that Easy Taxi blew into the market in Thailand and the rest of Southeast Asia. Nobody talks about them anymore. When Grab Taxi first started, um, Easy Taxi was already here, spending a ton of money, and they just got blown away because they just never managed their business right. It, it, it started with a lot of bluster and ended with like nothing. I know it ended with a whimper, really. And I think you're seeing the same thing here with Zen Rooms. Okay, so Zen Rooms is Rocket Internet's hotel booking platform. It's meant to be kind of at the lower end where you can stay at a place for $10, $15, $20 a night. Okay, and they just announced <clears> – <throat> when did this come out? Yeah, April 12th, so only a few days ago, that it had raised a $4 million, $4.1 million in Series A funding um, from a couple of small companies and also its existing investor, no big surprise, Asia Pacific Internet Group. It sounds like a bunch of people based in Asia that like the internet. <laughs> um, the only problem is that that's also a rocket company. And also Qatari Telecoms, which is also somebody that um, sponsors Rocket. So it's like Rocket putting more money into a rocket company. And frankly, I wouldn't be surprised, which is why it falls into this category, if that's, not a, that's a big surprise, if Zen Rooms kind of went away in a while. It's comparing itself to a company called Oyo Rooms in India, which has had its own problems. Um, you know, just getting budget hotels to sign up for this because their cost structure is so low to begin with 
than paying any money away to one of these aggregated booking systems. And what they found actually, here's what they found, is that over time, these built these um <clears throat> these booking platforms like Booking.com and Agoda have so much power over the big hotel chains, mm-hmm. and I think even some of these small hotels where you can stay for ten, fifteen, twenty dollars a night, they don't want to live under the tyranny of a of a overall and sort of aggregated booking system. And I just don't think a company like Zen Rooms is gonna go, is gonna be around for a long time. It probably is gonna get um acquired but it acquired at a price that makes no sense for its investors and i'm always skeptical when they announce when a company itself announces that its biggest investor is also putting in most of the new money and then announce it like it's some kind of surprising series a that the funding came from you know different people i don't know i'm sure red badge pacific is involved and sbi korea is involved but they're only raising four million dollars this is not a big deal and again not not a big surprise and won't be a big surprise if it's gone in a while michael what have you got in for these guys rocket internet they seem to make a regular feature in this big surprise <laughs> what is it about these guys that you don't like what is it all sorry let me rephrase it what is it about well, what they're doing that you don't like well i mean come up with something new seriously <laughs> like like have an original idea right i just and it's not that it's just you know people that do really big important things before they don't really say anything about what they're doing i i don't like stealth either because i i also have this feeling that you have an execution problem you don't have an idea problem everybody has the same ideas right yeah you know i invented the sort of automatic umbrella back in the 70s except i never executed it so i didn't really invent it but it's the same thing today right so having a booking engine for cheap hotel rooms this is not a big idea and nor is it actually a new idea but I don't like the – I don't even know if this is a word, but I'm going to say it anyway. I don't like the disingenuity around we raised a lot of money for a company that's not doing so well. And that money was raised by your existing investors yeah. and people with whom – over whom you have influence already. Right. So you're so saying they some- made it to look like it was an exciting round where a lot of people were involved. But in fact, it was just the same old guys but under different disguises. Yeah, look, I think the proof is in the pudding. They built a really, they built a really good business back in the day, 2011 and 2012, and made a ton of money with their Groupon cl- clone in Germany. Congratulations! They also built one of the largest um, online retail businesses in Europe. I forget the name of it, but it's really big and does a ton of turnover. I don't know if it is or if it's not profitable, so I won't comment on it. But everything that they've done in this region, because they wanted to be the biggest sort of investors and, and have the biggest impact in this region. You know, it's ended up to be a little bit of, uh, let's just say, not a success, for lack of a better term. <laughs> you know, we saw what happened with Lazada. Their investors lost a ton of money on this and will continue to do so. Easy Taxi, again, came into the market with a lot of bluster, left, like, very quietly. And I think Zen Rooms is going to be this, a, a similar outcome. So it's not like I have anything against anybody in particular, but, you know, your most successful people literally come into the market. They put their head down. They crank stuff out. And you don't even know they exist, really, because they're so busy trying to build stuff and not promote themselves. And maybe that's the problem is if you spent you spent nearly as much time like building things and so much less time promoting things, maybe your promoted things would actually get built better. That's yeah. It. Well, I, I can't disagree with you. But if you are listening and you are working or associated with Rocket Internet, then please send your flames tweets to Michael Waits. You're, you continue this discussion online, Twitter, Michael Waits. He's the man to direct your, your venom. Well, you, let's say a healthy disagreement. I think it should be more of a healthy disagreement. Yeah, I, I'm, I'll take any healthy discourse. I, I don't really mind, actually. But I just, again, you know, get, get to work, right? So, like, <laughs> build something big and, and just do the right thing. Yeah, you don't have time to tweet you. So let's get on with it. Fair enough. Exactly. Well, that was a good one, Michael. I'm sure these guys will be back next couple of weeks. Yeah, I'm sure. I'm sure, again, this will not be the last time because they're self-promoting, so I'm sure they'll be <laughs> themselves in the news anyway. Anyway, look, I think that's enough for today. You can find me at Michael Waits on Twitter. You can also you know, find us at asiatechpodcast.com. If you do want to contact us on Twitter, hashtag asiatechpodcast. Um, you can also find us on all of your social networks. Um, including Instagram. We post on Instagram as well. So find us there and also subscribe on iTunes. Look for us on the Asia Tech Podcast page on YouTube. Subscribe. Ask us anything and let us know how you feel. You've been listening to Asia Tech Podcast. 
Find out more at www.asiatechpodcast.com.